Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Time Friday. Tonight, the 29th of December, Mike Kelly is going to show, show us a sparrow and a gimp. And on the weekly tip, we're going to talk about how to guard your hackle. We're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho. Joining us tonight is our good buddy, Mike Kelly is from uh, La Vista, Nebraska, and has been tying flies for about 38 years. His passion is tying and fishing older, classic fly patterns that are made with natural fur and feathers. He is assistant program lead for Project Healing Waters in Omaha, where he does weekly fly pattern demonstrations and teaches fly tying classes. Mike, it's all yours. Thanks, Alan Gretchen. I appreciate the opportunity to show a couple of flies that were popular in their day, but you don't hear much about them anymore. Uh, both of these flies are tied with feathers that are often overlooked and discarded. So the first is a sparrow. And I have a short quote by Jack Gartside about this fly. Um, he said, I tied the first sparrow while camping in the on the Madison. Being a lazy fisherman, I hated changing flies more than absolutely necessary and wanted a fly that I could fish as a nymph, a streamer, or even a hopper when greased to float. So I tried to come up with an impressionistic fly that would combine common features of both insect and bait fish, a fly that could look, depending on how it was fished and its overall size, like a lot of things in general, but nothing in particular. I would let the fish make up their make up its own mind as to what it was. So the guard side sparrow, um, you can tell how it's an older fly because uh, um, the hook is a must add 9671, but it also shows some other ones. It can be tied anywhere from four to 14. Start getting close to 14. Some of the materials don't really work out well. I really don't. I go pretty much from six to 12. The tail is ring, ring neck pheasant rump marabou. Uh, the body is a squirrel rabbit blend or other dubbing. The collar is a ring neck pheasant back feather and the hackle is a ring neck pheasant aftershaft feather. There's a common mistake a lot of people make thinking that phyllo plume and aftershaft are synonyms, but uh, this graphic with basically the second and third feather there, phyllo plume is actually just a like a bristle with a few barbs at the tip of it, where the after shaft or the after feather is attached to uh, one of the one of the back feathers. There are a few, uh, a lot of different birds have these, uh, and I'll show you some examples in both of these flies tonight. Um, up here toward the top, this is where the neck is, and most of the blue has been taken away. Um, you could use those for cheeks or or for soft tackles. I have just a little bit of the white white ring around the neck. And uh, if you can get a skin that has some of these, you can use these for real nice uh, fan wing dry flies. And then uh, they call these al almond hearts. You can use them for uh, caddis tent style wings. Um, you can put a little uh, cement on them and use them as a, a beetle wing. A lot of people will put like a flex cement or something over those feathers. Um, the church windows, um, those are these in here. They look like uh, that dome shape around the outside and then the modeled in the middle. Those make really good hopper wings, uh, Matuka flies. Um, there's also a Mrs. Simpson, a New Zealand fly that uh, looks really good with a lot of these ring neck pheasant feathers. The back and rump area back here is, uh, there's some olive mostly in the middle of the back. And as it goes down the sides here, uh, it's a real shimmery blue color. Uh, but they're all real similar in markings, the olive and the blue. And those look uh, really good for, um, of course, the sparrow, Mrs. Simpson. They can also be used for spay flies if you don't have the uh, 
I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if any uh, popular spay patterns actually call for ringneck pheasant, but uh, some of these longer ones could be used for um, spay hackle. And then uh, also legs and tails on different flies. One of the feathers we're going to use tonight is an aftershaft feather. And I'll show you where that um, is. And then there's another special uh, feather on here. Uh, just like a lot of birds, like chickens, you have your chickaboo. I guess this would technically be called fezaboo, but um, it's a little marabou around the back of the legs back here. Um, you have it on both sides of the pelt. And so we're going to use one of those. So I'm just going to pluck one of those. Um, they normally have pretty square uh, tips. Here's a good one. So I'm going to pluck, pluck one of those free. And then um, the size hook I'm using is a size six. And so um, it's not that critical because a lot of these feathers are about the same size. But if I just kind of come in the middle here and select one of these feathers and pull it free from the skin, and I'll show you up closer to the um, to the vice camera, but uh, this is that aftershaft feather that's used for the head. I'm going to actually start about about a quarter of the way um, down from the eye because I have a uh, tackle collar and a head to tie on there. I'm going to go about down about halfway. And then I'll take that um, marabou feather and just stroke it back. I want the um, tail to be uh, a little bit longer than a than a the gap of the hook. And so I'll tie that in from here back. To the end of the shank. It's actually a little bit long. I'm going to shorten that some. All right. And then I'm going to take that rest of that feather. and just tie that down with some loose wraps. I'm gonna dub over that so it doesn't really matter what it looks like at this point. Normally the Gartside Sparrow was uh, a mix of olive and brown rabbit and squirrel. Uh, so I'm gonna use this um, SLF. It's a actually natural and synthetic blend. I'm gonna use the brown olive, which seems to look pretty good on this fly anyway. So. Pretty good amount out of there and kind of shape it into a little bit of an oval. Um, what I want to do is kind of get most of these fibers to kind of be going in the right direction and then stretch that out into an oval. And then I'll make a dubbing loop here. Close off the tip there. And then I'll place that dubbing in the dubbing loop. I think I'm going to need a little bit more than what I have. So I'm going to grab a little bit more dubbing. Then I'm going to spin that up. I want it to be pretty shaggy. 
Well, that looks pretty good. Now, instead of trying to wrap with my uh, dubbing whirl on there, I'm going to wrap this around a hackle, around a plunger style hackle pliers a few times and then cut that loose. So now I have a shorter thing that I'm working with here. Work that bare thread back to the back of the hook. It's like just about right. And back that off. Now, and tie that down. Clip it out of the way. Now, at this point, I want to, um, I have a little bit of Velcro on my bodkin handle. I'm just going to tease that out a little bit. And stroke it backwards. Now, uh, the next part is going to be, I'm going to save this. Here's that aftershaft feather. I'm going to save that off to the side. And then I'm going to just strip this fuzz away just to get it out of my way. Isolate the tip. And then I'm going to tie it down with a few wraps like that and then cut the excess loose. Now for this collar, I'm just going to stroke these back like you would any wet fly hackle. Take a couple of turns. It's about right. Tie that down. And now for the aftershaft feather. Now, one key about these is this outer, um, the upper part of the feather is very brittle. If you pull on it at all, it's going to break. Um, so a lot of times I'll just break that uh, right at the start. Um, but sometimes I can get lucky. I'm going to tie that in by the base. Come forward rid of that little wild hair there. And um, again, because of how sensitive that stem is, um, you don't want to try to do this with a hackle pliers. So I just want to take that after shaft feather. See there it broke. Now I might be able to use a hackle pliers because I'm in that thicker stem. Let's see. My, there it is. This is pretty safe because it has a little rubber pad um, to hold it. So it's not going to be sharp on that stem. Let's work that forward to make a shaggy head and a little bit more
And then I will whip finish. And that's a guard side sparrow. Now the next fly is pretty unique. Don't hear a whole lot about it. Um, this is called the gim. And if you look at it, the um, after shaft feathers that this uses are from a different type of pheasant. And they're laid flat down across the back. Other than that, it's it's very, uh, very much like a lot of our nymphs, um, but it has that wing that folds back across the back like that. Or the gimp, must add 30, 3906B, um, any nymph hook. The original said sizes 10 through 16. I do pretty much 10 through 14 usually, but I ha have a trick for smaller sizes as well. The natural dun hackle is the tail. Uh, the body is gray wool yarn. I'll use a, a dubbing instead. And then the wings are Amherst pheasant tippet aftershaft feathers. And the hackle is just a natural done hen hackle. So Lacey G and Erwin Sias co-authored this uh, small book, Practical Flies and Their Construction, in 1955. And it was revised in 1966. I think that's what this is. Yeah. Um, it was included in fly tying kits sold by Wapsie, Cabela's, and several other outlets. Um, Lacey G is also credited with uh, introducing turkey marabou to the fly tying world as a substitute for the feathers of the marabou stork, which at the time was you know illegal to obtain. But uh, he's credited with uh, finding the turkey marabou from uh, the food industry was a good substitute for that. And then in uh, 1945, he founded the Wapsi Fly Company on the banks of the Wapsi Pinnacon River in Northeast Iowa. He kept it until uh, 1973, he told it, sold it to Tom Schmucker who moved it to Arkansas. We talked about the aftershaft feather from the ringneck, uh, back ringneck pheasant. Um, let me go back to the, screen share i have some pictures that's better a better description than what i can do uh the one on the far left is a amherst pheasant crest uh this is normally how it's sold uh with the the beak and the the crest feathers across the head and then uh those tippets that hang off the back um on the right is a golden pheasant we're a little bit more familiar with uh the golden pheasant tippets are used on your uh um, Royal Coachman flies and uh, several other flies. And then the uh, golden pheasant crest feathers are used uh, a lot more often in uh, salmon flies and a lot of uh, Irish and Scottish flies. But uh, when the tippet feather is pulled out of the uh, Amherst pheasant neck right there, You've got a little small aftershaft feather showed in that picture just to the right of the crest there. And that's where that feather is. So what I did was got rid of the ugly shrunken heads and uh, put them in Ziploc bags several years ago. So I kept the uh, crest feathers to use as toppings on flies and sometimes tails. These are all the those Amherst um, tippets. but um, I harvested all of the um, gimp feathers, uh, put those in a bag by itself. So got a few left. I'm going to have to get another crest. Um, definitely use these long before I'll ever use any of the um, tippets. But um, that's just how I keep them. And I can show you at the vise on a golden pheasant um, where that um, comes off of there. So for this fly, um, I'm going to use this uh, gray thread. I already have a couple of my uh, aftershaft feathers set aside and a 
tackle for it. And then these are just some of the real thick, um, big uh, feathers around the outside of the hand neck that aren't used as often. And that's where I'll harvest my tail material. So again, here's a golden pheasant tippet. And right there at the base, um, you can see that these are a lot smaller um, than the Amherst um, aftershaft feathers. Um, it doesn't really even matter uh, how, how long this tippet is. Uh, those feathers are um, much smaller than the Amherst feathers. Amherst feathers also have a little bit of a white tip sometimes on the larger feathers. Um, but if you're going to tie 16 and maybe even try to do 18, um, you could use these golden pheasant aftershaft instead of the Amherst. Um, same feather for the most part, same shape and everything, but just a lot smaller. I'm doing this in a size 12. Just go about an eye length back, keep myself honest and not crowd the eye. I'm going to tie in the uh, pail. Um, if Paul's listening, I'm going to grab about nine or five hairs here. and strip them from the rachis. There's a lot more than nine or five, but um, I like to give it a kind of a bushy tail, about a hook shank in length, not an entire hook. And I'll tie that down, looks about right. And then I'm gonna come forward and just give it an angled cut. Smooth that out. Now I'll come back and I'm just going to use, uh, I normally either use, again, the original called for gray wool. Um, yarn, um, but I like to use natural um, when I can. So I took a little, a little snip off of this beaver, uh, beaver or muskrat. Beaver's a little bit closer to the color. I think muskrat's more of a just kind of has a like a blue gray to it. I just like the color of this beaver. So I just have a clump of um, beaver under under fur there. And now I'm gonna work that back to the back. And then Dub a nice smooth body to the front. Here's my uh, two aftershaft feathers. And normally I just lay them back to back and, and tie them on. But I started to like, um, I did it accidentally once. And I like started to like it that way, where the tips are just split slightly across the back. And of course, that means absolutely nothing except to me. Um, it doesn't do anything for function or for. So it looks like the length of these, I want it to be a little, little more than halfway down that tail. So I just kind of marked that with my thumb and I'm going to strip away some of that. Um, the barbs at the base there. So now I can take the other one and even that up and make sure they are the same. That one was a little bit shorter, so they're going to line up just fine. 
make sure I've got them oriented right so that the concave side faces down. And I'm going to tie one feather on at a time here with just a slight cant off to one side here. That one goes slightly off to that side. And then I'll even up the tips. And then I'll come in and clean up those butt ends. And now I already selected a uh, soft tackle. Isolate out the tip. Take a couple wraps. Hold that over, and then I should be able to grab that tip. Snap it forward. About three wraps. And I actually probably have enough hackle there for one more fly. So I'll set that off to the side. And then I have this semper fly thread that is very small, so it's kind of hard for me to build a head here, but it's what I had in gray loaded in the bobbin, so that's what I used. And whip finish. And that's the gimp. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of two things here. One of them is uh, like making an extended body with poly yarn. And I don't know if Al's ever shown this or not. Um, but that's what I'll do first is say for a, a hopper body or... Um, something where you like a large nymph where you want to make an extended body. You can take this um, poly yarn, twist it up. You have to twist it clockwise unless you're in Australia, then you have to twist it counterclockwise. <laughs> and then just grab it back about the length you want the extended body and let it go and it'll furl. And then tie it off that way. And that gives a real nice extended body. I do that on all my hoppers now, like a Dave's hopper. Um, I'll use a yellow poly yarn and then uh, twist that extended body, making a, a like a parachute wing. So let's say my parachute wing is going to be about right there. What I'll, let's see. So I'll tie in my poly yarn. couple of nice snug turns and then I'll take the rest of this poly yarn and cut it at a long angle and then that'll let me taper this down into the body if I wasn't leaving that one piece it wouldn't be so hard to wrap this but um, so I've got that tapered down into the, so my body tapers up to where the wing is. I think you get the point. And 
Now, for my parachute post, I'm going to do the same thing. Twist it clockwise or counterclockwise if you're in Australia. And then furl it like that. And I'll just hold it there. And now I'm going to take that poly yarn. Clip off the rest of this so it's not in the way. Tie that at the base there. And then I'll do the same thing with that poly yarn in the front. Cut that at an angle and then tie that down. So now I have a parachute post, but there's no bulk there at all because I've got it tapered off down this way and tapered toward the front. And now with it being furled like that, it's not spreading all over the place. And it's pretty easy to come up and start posting it. And it keeps it gathered. So you know, post it and get, get it to where you want it. And then once you've got your hackle wrapped and everything's all done with the fly, you know, decide how long you want your post to be. Cut it. And then you can just take your bodkin and buzz that stuff back out. We're headed into the weekly tip. And tonight we're going to talk about guarding your hackle or hackle guarding or something like that. But in guarding your hackle, no, we're not talking about a guard dog to guard your hackle. However, a critter that looked very similar to this was one of the guard dogs on Whiting Farms when we worked there. So what, were, what are we really up to? Well, we're looking at fixing and captured, accidentally captured fibers like we have here. And there's a, a number of ways to do that, and we've shared a couple of them with you over recent weeks in the weekly tip. And tonight, we're going to, um, well, we're going to share, share a different one with you. And I had forgotten about this. I, I used this tool uh, for years and years uh, because of uh, my hands were crippled, and Gretchen's were too, and and about 10 years ago, we had operations on our hands to fix the problem. So we haven't had to use this particular tool, and it kind of went by the wayside. But this week, Steve Atonic bought a set of these. They're called hackle guards. We're going to show you a close-up version here in just a little bit. And the way they come to you, well, quite frankly, um, until you do some fine adjustment to this particular tool, it's a piece of junk. I bought these like 40 years ago, and for the first 25, 30 years that I had the doggone things, I never used them. I said, I tried them once. I said, darn, this is not any good at all, and threw them in a drawer until my hands got so crippled that I couldn't bend my fingers around anymore to stroke the fibers back. And anyway, let's move over to the materials vice for a second here, Gretch, and let's open up this new packet Hackle guards, and I'll show you just what what we have, how they come to you, and I want you to notice that um, the slot. Now I have to get over here at the vise. You can see that there is a slot right there that the thread goes through. Well, I want you to notice right there where. It gets to the hole, it gets so close together that if you don't do something to fix that slot, making it slightly wider with a screwdriver or some such, it's going to cut your thread. Then you want to take uh, an emery board or something like that and smooth up the edges. Now, the other thing that it's not worth a darn is I want you to notice the angle of the handle. That puts your thumb right, right, let's see, I'm trying to wrap thread and it puts my thumb right in the way of the thread. But what you want to do is what I've done here with another, another pair. I've taken this and I've spread this apart right here, put the emery board in there, and then I bent this back at a nice angle so that when I hold the tool, my thumb is not in the path of the rotation of the bobbin. So let me show you how this works. 
what you have to first, the first thing you have to do is you got to slip the thread up through this slot. If you can see that. So let's just do that. Now you just slip that down around uh, the eye of the hook. And you see how you can pull those fibers back and do like we've done in the past when we do it with our fingers. We do a jam knot and a thread hit all at the same time, but it really keeps those fibers out of the way. And now we want to get that out of there. And I want you to notice that we've got a, a really nice, nice looking head with all fibers pushed back out of the way. And that's the tip for tonight. Sharing on BTs tonight. And like always, we like to turn to those of you who have joined us for the evening and get ideas and inspiration from you all. And we're going to start with Evelyn, who is our resident artist. And she is going to share first uh, a, a, a uh, art piece of artwork on a presentation that I did earlier in the week on Tuesday. And then she'll uh, do a, the artwork for Mike's Two Flies tonight. Go ahead, Evelyn. Okay. Yes, that was, a, wow. that was a great wolf that I did last Tuesday yeah. for Fly Fishers International Techniques. That uh, looks great. That is a good job, Evelyn. Good, I good know. job. And now Mike's first fly, the sparrow. This one didn't come out so good. I don't have the right colors. Uh, that looks pretty darn good to me, Evelyn. Pretty darn. That looks on. really good. And and you didn't break your aftershaft feather. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> good job, Evelyn. There, you might teach Mike how to how to not have that problem. <laughs> Here's the gimp. And there's the gimp, yes. Oh, I love oh, that. That's really good, too. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you, Evelyn. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank, thank you so you. much there. Now, Now there's some... We received some things that we'd like to share with all of you. And I'm going to start first... I've got a bunch of things to share, but I'm going to start first with uh, this that I got in from Australia. Oh, yeah, this is... This is one of the most stunning um, calendars I've ever seen. And what it is is scenes of historic Australia. And a lot of it's about the outback and the pioneers, the, the pioneers and the cattle industry and, you know, just some incredible artwork. And I could go on and on. I'm going to do another one because I got a couple here that I really like a lot. Ah, this one right here. I used to shoe horses, so I well understand uh, the problems there that this fellow would be going through. And on the back, then, that's all of the pictures that are are with this calendar. But Paul Fidelis, thank you. We will treasure this. It will be hanging over our desks for a year. So thank you. Well, maybe yep. longer. What's that? Maybe longer than a year just for the pictures. Well, for the, well, we could just take it frame the pictures after the year is done. Huh? I suppose. Let's don't write on this one. We want to keep this one nice and clean. <laughs> okay. Now, we want to get into something else here. And I think this is my slide. Yeah, here we are. We're going to talk about uh, some stuff. First off, down at the bottom right corner is a box of flies we got from Joyce Westfall. I'll show you the actual box here in just a minute. But I took a picture to add in here. And I want you to notice these are just some of the flies that she tied and sent to us. And I think they're just absolutely gorgeously mounted in this box. And I want you to notice left-hand side, top fly, not the pink one, but the second row down, it says the bubble done. Joyce, what a great job of the bubble done and not any that tells me that you've been watching us for a while because it's been several months since we tied the bubble done. Anyway, uh, for that now, a few weeks ago, we showed you all a nymph, an emerger that we had, had developed and we called it the KX emerger. And it basically was, was uh, built on ideas that we got from John Kreft's website and the photography that he does. Well, Paul, didn't have the materials that he needed, so he used poly yarn for the head and wing, and he called it Al's Corrupted Nymph. Paul, that looks really cool. 
probably is better than the one that I was going to all this trouble trying to tie hair on the hook. Thank you. It's a swarm. It's a sw it's a swarm of Al's corrupted nymphs. <laughs> I, and I didn't come up with that name. That was the one that Paul did. What they are is pen holders for like repeating or, uh, you know, marker pens. <clears throat> and they're sloped. So the shelving sits like this. Uh, and they're really handy to put a, tools in everything at your tying bench because they're not vertical. <laughs> they're they're sl they slope. They're pretty inexpensive. Back to the container thing, Al. I know you got a fetish for containers. <laughs> but now, wait a minute. That was originally they were designed to hold magic markers. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh -huh. It's just a slope. that They call them pen and pencil holders. You oh, look it up okay. on Amazon and you'll find them. They're narrow. They're about three inches wide, maybe, and about almost eight, not quite eight inches tall. So they'll fit in and you can lay them flat on the, flat on the <laughs> table or vertical. And they have about four... Four compartments are really handy. I'll have to though. look those up. Ah, good one. We'll look on for pen and pencil holders. You are now spotlighted, Rick. Yes. Whoops. You, you go? got that. You're going to have to keep it in front of your your body because you've got that background on and it's going to cut you out. Yeah. There you go. That's pretty so, good. So those are those little boxes you were telling us about. Yeah. And this one, I'm starting to put my smaller smaller hooks in, and then. <clears throat> I didn't realize I had so many beads, and that's not even complete. But oh my, beads are perfect for beads! I'm telling you. Yeah, that was um. I forget. I forget who gave us that tip. Yeah, uh, it's this thing way better than what I was using before. Well, good. I'm glad it's working for you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. The last uh, meeting of the year. For now, it's a wrap.